what does happen when Ukraine actually wins? Does that mean that, that the Putin regime falls? I don't think that that's inevitable or uh, a necessary outcome. Uh, does that mean that the Russians might go nuclear? Uh, they might. But interestingly, the Ukrainians have said that will not stop them, even though they would be the ones that would uh, be the target of a Russian tactical nuclear weapon. And all of the other countries that are closest to Russia and have the most experience being under Russian control, they absolutely are for Ukraine winning. So we do have to think through what does it mean if Crimea is liberated? What does, what does that mean for the Putin government and for how they might respond? Putin can change the narrative whenever he wants. This is what autocrats do. <clears throat> they change the narrative to suit their needs. And his number one objective is not hanging on to Crimea. His number one objective is staying in power. And I think if he does the calculation that he remains in power, even after losing Crimea, then they'll do that. that that's the calculation. I don't see support for Ukraine as a bitter issue. I'm, I'm more concerned that People lose interest. It requires my president and our leaders to explain to voters why this matters, why it's worth the already more than $40 billion worth of equipment and ammunition and aid that the U.S. has provided to explain what that means for us as well as what it means for stability and security in Europe. That's, that's my biggest concern is that people lose interest in it and begin to question why are we doing this. Well, three things, really. Uh, number one, American prosperity depends on prosperity in Europe, and prosperity in Europe depends on stability and security in Europe. Uh, so the, the fighting in and around Ukraine, what Russia is doing, directly affects American prosperity. So there's a, there's a selfish reason, if you will, or pr selfish practical reason, uh, number one. Number two, the, uh, the Chinese, of course, are watching. Are we really serious when we say uh, respect for sovereignty, respect for freedom of navigation, respect for human rights, respect for international law, that all of these things are important? If we're not willing to actually do what's required to protect those things, then I think the Chinese will not be too terribly impressed if we say that about the Indo-Pacific region, where it will be much more difficult to actually defend those values than it is in Europe. So the, the counteroffensive obviously is not going as quickly or smoothly as anybody had hoped, but that's not the metric. Uh, the metric is, will it accomplish what is required to help Ukraine liberate Crimea and achieve victory in this war? It's frustrating to say the least when I hear the chairman of the Joint Chiefs or other American officials uh, bemoan that the offense counteroffensive is not going so well or that it's really hard when in fact we are not providing some of the critical capabilities that Ukraine needs, specifically long-range precision weapons. You know, UK made the decision months ago, France has made the decision, but the US has resisted providing the 300 kilometer range ATACMs, for example, or other longer range precision weapons that would neutralize the only advantage the Russians have, which is mass, and they would make the Crimean Peninsula untenable for the Black Sea Fleet and the Russian Air Force to operate from there. Why do we not provide that capability? And I think it's tied to the inability or unwillingness for the administration, the Biden administration, to say that they want Ukraine to win. And it's this absence of a clear strategic objective that is causing us to make incremental decisions and drip, drip the uh, aid that Ukraine needs to win. I don't get the sense that there's an imminent decision on this, and I, I don't understand it. Uh, I, I think the administration is overly concerned the, about a possible Russian nuclear escalation. Of course, nobody wants that, and, and I don't mean to sound dismissive of it, but I think that the Russians know that all they have to do is mention nuclear weapons or announce that they're sending a tactical nuclear weapon to Belarus and that we, we will freeze, that we um, continue to deter ourselves. The, the Russian nuclear weapons are really most effective when they don't use them because of the effect it has on us. And then I think that the administration still, despite all the good work it has done, it has too many people that um, misunderstood Russia during the Obama administration. 
and they somehow think that Russia can be dealt with as a responsible state actor. And so we hesitate to do what needs to be done uh, to think strategically and act decisively to help Ukraine win. And I think that's why we are where we are. The Ukrainians know that they will never be safe or secure as long as Russia occupies the Crimean uh, Peninsula. Uh, as long as Russians, Russia's Black Sea Fleet can operate from Sevastopol, as long as the Russian Air Force can fly from there, as long as they can launch Shahid drones and other uh, weapons from Crimea, Ukraine will never be safe and they'll never be able to rebuild their economy because all five of Ukraine's major seaports, even after, say, Mariupol and Berdansk are liberated, will be blocked or disrupted by Russia. And so the Ukrainians are going to do whatever they have to do to liberate Crimea. It is doable. I honestly, months ago, had predicted that and thought that they could do this by the, even by the end of this summer. But that was on the assumption that the U.S. would provide what was needed, specifically the long-range weapons capable of making Crimea untenable. I mean, if Ukraine had the 300-kilometer range ATACMS now, for example, the Black Sea Fleet would have already had to leave Sevastopol because it's 300 kilometers exactly from Odessa to Sevastopol. By the way, I don't work for a company that, <laughs> that makes ATACMS. I, I try to stay away from endorsing specific weapons, and I prefer to talk about capability, like long-range precision strike. But that's the effect that we uh, uh, that Ukraine needs, and, and we have not provided it. And so, therefore, um, the, the pace of what the Ukrainians are doing is less, and it's more costly than it would otherwise be. The amount of time required uh, is driven by or is affected by the depth of these Russian minefields. Uh, I have to give the Russians credit. They did not waste the time that we gave them. Um, they, they used the time over the past many months, uh, strengthening fortifications right in front of our eyes. Uh, and the minefields, the, the depth and density of these minefields is significant. And it, there is no fast way to do it. Of course, uh, what would accelerate it was if uh, Ukrainians were able to uh, knock out the artillery uh, that enables Russian defenders to stop Ukrainian attackers from breaching the minefields. I mean, the minefields, if they're not protected by indirect fire from the Russian side, then you can get up there and you can clear lanes through the minefield and continue the attack. So an important part of this is to destroy the Russian artillery. Uh, and that's what the Ukrainians are trying to do, by the way. They've, they've adapted their tactic to go after the artillery and the logistics that make the obstacle belts uh, so difficult. But this, this is just going to take a lot of time, especially if we don't provide those capabilities that are needed. Well, I think um, it's impressive, uh, not just on the ground, but what the Ukrainians are doing uh, to create problems for the Russian side. Uh, the use of uh, maritime drones, for example, uh, going after uh, another Russian Navy ship, as well as uh, going after one of these uh, oil uh, vessels that was supporting the Black Sea Fleet, that creates real dilemmas uh, on the Russian side, that they have to start worrying about things. And Ukraine saying that all the Russian ports on the Black Sea are now, that's in the zone of war. And I think Ukrainians will be smart about this because they don't want to cause so much disruption um, that it affects Western support, but they want to try and take the initiative here against the Russians instead of always responding to what the Russians are doing. Um, I, I think that on the ground, they are looking for different places where they can, in fact, create a penetration, get through somehow. And then once they get through, then you can begin to change the dynamic on the ground. This is typical Ukrainian adaptation going after uh, Russian vulnerabilities. When we talk about air power, you, you generally think in terms of airplanes, uh, manned aircraft, but increasingly in modern warfare, uh, the use of different types of drones to carry out different types of tasks is a part and parcel of, of how we fight. And the Ukrainians are showing all of us the different ways that they can do this. Uh, Russian Air Force still does not dare enter Ukrainian airspace because Ukrainian air defense is still so effective. And so the Russians are having to launch 
uh, attacks from outside of Ukraine or from behind uh, their own lines because of Ukrainian air defense. Ukrainians, I mean, keep in mind the, the geographical size difference, the population size difference, and yet after really since 2014, but more specifically over the last 18 months, Russia has steadily lost ground. The Ukrainians uh, are continuing to whittle away at the Russian-controlled parts of eastern Ukraine. What they are not able to do yet without our assistance is make Crimea untenable. And I, I know I sound a little bit like a scratched record on this, but if you can make Crimea untenable, then all the Donbass, it, it doesn't matter. The only reason the Russians care about Donbass is because they want that land bridge that connects Crimea to mainland Russia because they recognize the vulnerability of the Kerch Bridge. And so if you make Crimea untenable with the use of long-range weapons, whatever type they are, this war will be over. And that's the, I think that's our problem, is that the administration is not committed to that outcome. The so-called front uh, between Russian forces and Ukrainian forces is hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of miles long. So there will be uh, local uh, tactical actions uh, going back and forth for control over certain villages, towns, river crossings, that sort of thing. Uh, none of that really matters. What, what matters most <clears throat> is Ukraine's ability to uh, generate combat power to penetrate the Russian defenses in two or three different places where they can then get into the rear area and resume uh, maneuver warfare. So that they will be making decisions and choices on, on priorities up and down that line. Uh, the, the, I think that they've made the calculation that Russia does not have the ability to actually exploit any breakthrough. So even if Russian forces might capture a few kilometers in one area, there's, I don't think, I don't see uh, reporting that there are large mobile Russian forces waiting to exploit any kind of a breakthrough. So I think the Ukrainian general staff is pretty confident that they can handle something like that up, up and around Kharkiv uh, because the Russians don't have the ability to exploit it. And, and this is always the challenge for any commander is to stay focused on your main effort. What is the critical task you've got to achieve? And you husband your forces to, to make sure that everything is committed to the main effort and don't get distracted by other things. And particularly if that's what the enemy is trying to do is to distract you away from your main effort uh, and to cause you to use resources in those places. One impact is that uh, many more people are going to die needlessly uh, that don't have to. And, and uh, and impact on uh, global economies, imp impact on uh, food shortages or availability of food supplies, I should say. Uh, all of these things uh, are going to continue as long as this conflict continues. Um, so it's in our interest to help Ukraine win and, and bring this thing to a conclusion. I don't think any serious person really believes that can read a map and they can read a history book and understands Russia. I don't think any serious person believes that Russia will be satisfied with some sort of negotiated uh, peace settlement. Um, they'll just, they'll wait until uh, the next opportunity comes along and, and we lose and we lose interest. So I, I think that the um, Ukrainians understand that uh, we all want to see them get this done uh, and so they will feel pressure. They will feel the need to deliver something. But at the same time, President Zelensky and General Zaluzhny are not going to waste the lives of their soldiers to meet some arbitrary timeline imposed by the U.S. or U.K. or Germany or the West. Um, this, this was very interesting to me. Uh, the fact that so many countries, including China, um, as you say, uh, participated, um, shows uh, that Ukraine has an appealing and compelling narrative. Ukraine was driving the agenda at these peace talks. Russia was not invited. Now, that this was an important point because it also shows that Russia is increasingly isolated. And, and I think that um, we'll have to wait and see what actually comes out of it in, in real terms. But the approach by the Ukrainians to focus on 
principles, international principles about sovereignty, about um, human rights. These are the kind of things that most nations can get behind that would want to support. Um, so I, I think a, a wise approach by the Ukrainian side uh, to uh, to focus on these principles that are embedded in the in the UN Charter, and, and I think that makes it easier for some countries to support Ukraine versus making it just Ukraine versus Russia. And, and of course, Russia still has a lot of leverage over many countries, either because of energy supplies or um, threats of the use of force or, or uh, other other means. Um, I, I can't I can't really make out the the true nature of this relationship between China and Russia, the so-called friends without limits or that sort of thing. I, I never believed that that was the truth, that these were friends without limits. Clearly, there are limits. Uh, President Xi has told Russia not to use a nuclear weapon. I think China's number one interest is maintaining access to cheap gas from Russia. Um, I think the Chinese also prefer maintaining a status quo. They, they're not interested in uh, seeing a collapse of the Russian regime not because they love Putin, but because they want to maintain status quo. And I think they don't want people to see the vulnerabilities inherent in an autocratic government. So if the Russian regime were to collapse, all the vulnerabilities that led to that would be uh, even more exposed for everyone else to see. And of course, the uh, the government of President Xi does not want to see that happen. So I, I think the Chinese are looking for a way to uh, protect their interests. Um, and, and, and all of those interests do not necessarily line up with Russian interests. And it, it does seem that the U.S. government and probably others are looking for ways to, um, with an eye towards our own relationship with China in the Indo-Pacific region, is there a role for China to play? Do, do you really believe that if um, Russia is allowed to keep Crimea, and, and I, it drives me absolutely crazy when I hear uh, senior European officials or American officials say, come on, let them have Crimea, let Russia have Crimea. I mean, you wouldn't, <laughs> we wouldn't say, come on, for the sake of peace, you know, let Mexico have Texas or, or something like that, or, or let Canada have Maine. No, we wouldn't do that. So why, why do we feel it's somehow okay to tell Ukraine to just let Russia have Crimea for the sake of peace. Nobody who knows anything about Russia really uh, should believe that there would be a lasting peace. What, what would be happening is that uh, Russia will have been rewarded for violating just about every international law there is and using force to wreck the sovereignty of a European country and, and basically violating all the different agreements that Russia has made since the 1950s. We should think uh, long term about this. Is stopping the fighting, is that actually the number one priority? I, I don't think so.